Hey everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show and welcome to Forensics Talks. This is going to be episode 63 and today my guest is David Dustin who's going to be speaking to us about some of the challenges and admissibility surrounding 3D evidence. Now don't forget we are live streaming to YouTube, Facebook and LinkedIn and now podcasts too. I keep announcing that so that people can go on to their favorite podcasting service and make sure you have a look because we do have a lot of episodes that are going back there. Uh, not every single one but I have probably got about 40 or so. I just released a whole bunch um, that were just last week. Uh, as always, always interested in where people are from. So if you can, in the chat window, just uh, say hello and let us know where you're from. Uh, that's always good to know. Uh, I'm going to type that in there, uh, where you're from. Yeah. And what I um, just want to say, if you have any questions along the way, uh, please put them in there. We are going to uh, go ahead and uh, try to post some of the questions uh, to David. So let's get started here right away. We're going to jump in and let me bring up my notes here. So uh, David Dustin is currently the Director of Business Development and the Techno Technical Director for Public Safety at Faro Technologies. And David started his career working in the automation industries, working with automated assembly systems. And during his career, he also provided industrial simulations and created things like assembly line animations and other visualizations. In 2001, he founded Dustin Productions, which eventually turned into Dustin Forensics. And here he created 3D models, illustrations, uh, photorealistic animations for crash and crime scene cases. And he also it, got introduced to things like the laser scanners, total stations, photogrammetry, a number of different 3D technologies. In November of 2017, Dustin Forensics was acquired by Faro Technologies, and that's sort of the, the beginning of how David got involved with Faro. And uh, full disclosure, I've known David now for probably over two decades. I think it's over two decades now. And we have worked together on projects. We've trained police agencies together. And, uh, you know, when we were both making the career change at, at about the same time, this is way back in like 2001, we sort of had a very similar journey together and we were helping each other. And so I consider him a, a very, very great resource, resource and also a great friend. So let me bring him on in here. There he is. Hey, Dave, how you doing? Hey, Eugene. I'm really happy to be here. Excellent. Thanks, well, thanks thank you so much. Experts. Yeah, I'm hoping, uh, I, don't, I don't know what we're going to talk about just because we know each other so well. You know, usually when I do these things, it's uh, people I don't know very well and they're, they work in areas or disciplines that I'm not familiar with. So, you know, somebody doing DNA or whatever, I got to do a lot of research and stuff. And, and I did do a little bit of research here, but certainly I, I know you a lot more and we have a lot of things we can talk about and a lot of things we can't talk about. So, right. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes, but let me ask you, let me start by asking you about your beginnings and um, you know, when, before you were, uh, sort of working and you know when you were younger were you always like a technical kid were you always like into the you know the, the electronic stuff or what what, what were yeah. you like so I was always I was always you know back back then the way you know houses were constructed and things uh, I remember my parents always complaining because I would like unscrew the door handles and of the house even I mean I loved tools and mechanisms and things from from a very early age, I, I built my first robot with my erector set when I was five. And of course, I thought I was pretty amazing to make one at that. You know, I mean, it, it just seemed so cool. And so I've always been kind of a tinkerer like that. I remember taking apart um, like uh, uh, dryer, dryers and washing machines and taking the controls out, the little rocker panels and figuring out how to design uh, small control systems with them, you know, energizing motors and relays and things like that. And, you know, I just, was, I've just always been that way. I've always enjoyed that. So, uh, yeah, I always have been, I always have been a technical, technical person all my life. Yeah. And, um, you know, during the course of, you know, Dustin Forensics, Dustin Productions. I mean, we're going to be talking about laser scanners and different types of 3D evidence. What was, what was the transition? Like what, what got you thinking about getting into this area of 3D or starting Dustin Productions? So, so I started Dustin Productions because, you know, I wanted to do, uh, I was doing a lot with video back then, which is why the productions name came in. But then I, you know, pretty quickly realized that it, it was, it wasn't just productions. I was doing, you know, a lot of other things, but um, I just have always 
seen, you know, when you present things in 3D or or with visual, uh, that the retention is so much higher, so much better with it that um, that it just always struck me as a very powerful media uh, medium, I guess. And laser scanning, I remember actually you and I talking. Uh, we were talking about the ferrophoton, and which, for those of you that don't know, is not a small device. It's really large. It's quite cumbersome by today's standards. And uh, traditionally, I was doing all of my cases where I would either use a total station or, or heaven forbid, I would out and I would go out and do hand measurements. And I had a case in, I want to say it was Nashville or somewhere in that area, and I hired hired a guy by the name of Mark Hanna to come out and uh, and scan it for me. And while the data wasn't that fantastic, um, I saw that it was, you know, it was really useful, it saved me a lot of time. And I also had done a couple of cases where I received Leica data where I was able to construct, um, you know, use it and, and build an entire environment out of it. And it, it just saved me so much more time and it was so much more realistic than having to do it just from, you know, maybe going from a hundred data points to millions of data points, right? I mean, you have captured everything from, you know, the wires going between telephone poles and you had all of that information that otherwise was just more of a guess. And then when the Ferro Focus came and I, and I was, I was interested in buying a laser scanner and I had reached out to most of the existing manufacturers and tried to get quotes and, Unfortunately, most of them were outside of my budget. And then when the the very the first Ferro Focus was released, 2009, 2010, something like that, I I decided I was going to buy a Ferro Focus. And everybody, everybody on the planet except Eugene Leeshio, <laughs> thought I had lost my mind. And uh, but I went, I was a small company. I went, I, I created a business case. I had to get a loan for it and bought this, bought this device. And then I remember asking our, my sales rep at the time, um, do you, so where, what kind of training can I get? He said, training, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, so, so then it was, you know, just that, that long, that self-education process and, uh, and you know, just networking with other other folks. That's probably yeah. a longer answer than you were waiting. For. No, no, it's great. Uh, I, I think it's fine. And it, it's an interesting point because sometimes people say, you know, I, I'm, I've been using the Ferro system for a long time. So people say, like, you know, why'd you choose the Ferro system? Honestly, because it was the cheapest thing I could get my hands on. It was the most economical. Everything else was two or three times the, the price. Right? Um, there were some other little reasons, but honestly, like if if it had been priced as high, you know, I, I don't know that I would have been able to purchase it really at the time it isn't it, it i mean it's it's an expensive piece of I equipment i think my first my first scanner was thirty two thousand dollars us mm -hmm. if i remember right that was with warranty and everything and um and at that time i i mean it's, it's still a lot of money but comparatively speaking you know that was a that was a big jump and i paid for that piece of equipment i i paid the loan off early uh, i made a ton of money with it you know it was a it was a great decision, of course, but everybody thought I had lost my mind. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Um, what about the? I mean, obviously, around. I mean, around that time, it, this would have been like a little after two thousand and I don't know, eleven, twelve, or something like that. It was, it was early, uh, you know, after the after two thousand ten. But um, you've obviously seen a transition and a greater adoption. But I'm just wondering, you know, was there a particular time where you just said, wow, yeah, now everybody's got laser scanners or um, how have they transformed, you know, crime and crash scene reconstruction? I remember going on vehicle inspections somewhere around 2011. Of course, back then we were using targets and everyone else was there with the total station, except for me, I was there with the laser scanner. And of course I was done in minutes and had millions and millions of data points. And I told, I remember telling them, you know, this is the, this is the wave of the future. This is the way of the future. And of course, some snickered and whatever, but now they're all using laser scanners. <laughs> as far as an adoption, you know, I think it depends upon, um, I, I think recently it's become so common, right? I mean, you see so many laser scanners now that it's, it's almost unfathomable fathomable to consider a time when we didn't. 
but I would say it was probably around the fastest adoption rate was probably starting somewhere around that 2017. That was where I, you know, I remember just really starting to see more and more pick up. And then of course, you know, competitive hardware comes in, you know, different price points and that just, you know, increases the adoption rate. So, um, yeah, I, I think it really took off 2017, 2018, right around there. Okay. Well, is it fair to say, like, if we had to look at, just to pick a round rough number, would you say there are, and I don't mean just feral, but I mean just everybody, is it fair to say that in North America, there are hundreds, thousands of units uh, out there, thousands of agencies? Scanning? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, I, I know I'll, I'll speak just from Pharaoh's perspective, but there are at least a thousand agents, it's a thousand agencies plus in in the U.S. alone that are using, I know, Pharaoh systems or Pharaoh in general. So, right. right. Um, and that's, I remember doing a presentation back in, it was 2017, I think, at one of the Pharaoh events, and it was in the 200s, low 200s. So, you know, that, that's what I'm saying. That, that adoption rate has, has just continued to grow. Okay. Well, we're going to lead into talking about admissibility and court and stuff like that. So let me ask you about your experiences at court. And do you remember, before you were with Pharaoh, um, you were obviously were testifying and such. So do you remember your first experience uh, bringing scan data to court? I do. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a gang-related uh, homicide. It was uh, here in Atlanta, a suburb of Atlanta. And I remember when I was, uh, I had I was working with the crash team, and they were they wanted to buy 3D laser scanners, and so they would get me involved in these different cases because I lived so close. I could pack up my gear and I could get down there really quickly. And I remember, uh, so we scanned this scene where this this homicide was. So it was it was me and my scanner and probably six or eight of these officers. They had total stations. Uh, they had one, one total station, but I was done before they were, I started a little after them and I finished before them. And I had all of this, all of these data points. And I remember I met with the prosecutor. He's a good friend of mine. He's gone on to do a lot of really cool things. And uh, I was sitting at a table away from his desk and he was, he was doing some other things. And I said, well, just I'll, I'll open up the laser scans and show you what it looks like. And so I opened it up and I, and he just it caught the he caught it out of the corner of his eye and he just zeroed right in on it. And he came over and he sat down by me and he was just absolutely blown away by the level of detail that, you know, a laser scanner actually captured. And so that was my first experience as far as getting the data admitted to, to trial, uh, the way that the Georgia courts were. So I had to be declared an expert and then we'd submitted everything as evidence. Uh, there was no no contesting that, and then um, you know, and then we just during the course of the trial we used it and we were taking measurements live and similar to your experiences, but just to see to see that reaction from the jury and the judge when they saw what what was able to be captured was it was it's it's quite edifying when you you get that you get that feedback from the crowd as it were right. Um, you, you realize you're, you're really onto something cool here. Yeah. I think we, we chatted once about this and the fact that, you know, jurors don't have a, an easy job because they got to sit there for days or weeks on end and they're listening to some stuff is going to be super dry, right? So these people are falling asleep, but when it's something visual and you're moving and it's dynamic and you can do, you know, cool stuff, whatever they tend to perk up. Right. And yeah, so that's kind of cool. What about the, uh, have uh, have you ever had an experience where, for example, like a judge or a prosecutor has said something like, hey, this is really cool, like this is really helpful or, or whatever, uh, something similar? Right. So um, one of our one of the most recent hearings we had. So there was a motion to exclude and basically a Dalbert challenge to for a case we just did in Florida. And uh, I, I was talking with the prosecutor and she had informed me that the judge had already told her that, you know, so this, he's a guy about my age, um, maybe not quite as technical as me. I think he said he still has a flip phone, but he said that, you know, he wasn't very inclined to allow this data in and she had a real uphill battle to allow it to be introduced. And so 
the method that that I use, which is a common tactic that I know for sure you and I do, and probably some of the others that are on this uh, are you know on this meeting, are I, I had scanned the courtroom ahead of time, and so as I'm introducing it to the judge and describing it, then I opened the scan the scans from the courtroom, and the judge actually came down from his bench, and he was standing in front of this large display, and I'm rotating around the the courtroom. And every time I did, I noticed he would look and he was going back and forth and he's, you know, he's got his hand on his chin and he's just paying attention. And I had, I had a, a, a Ferro scale bar and I had a, like a, like a one meter ruler or something in the, in the area as well. And I was pulling measurements on that and showing him how that worked. And then I had performed a scan from the judge's bench and so I switched to that view and I said, Your Honor, I think you, you may recognize this view. And he just started smiling. He was just like, this is really amazing. And so, um, so yeah, you, when, you, when you see that light bulb go off, it, it's, it's, it's rewarding for sure, but sometimes entertaining. Yeah. So it's an interesting point. So you've had the scanner inside of the courtroom. About how many times have you done that now? Oh gosh, it's probably five or six times that I've actually done that. But I always take my scanner in. I set it up, especially when I'm explaining to the jury, and and I I'm I don't I don't try to be a salesperson. I'm just describing how the box works, you know, and showing them you know, how it rotates, how the mirror spins, and I I use very simple analogies when I'm talking about my laser or the laser, and I'll just say something to the point of so effectively what this device does is it it paints the room with light and as soon as you use an analogy like that they get it automatically they they understand what exactly what you're doing and especially then you tell them you know you're capturing millions of data points and you explain that it's doing a calculation so it's just based on the speed of light and it just calculates how far away that device is and it and it or that point is and it knows where it is in 3d space and it's just a very simple analogy to them and then they get it and then of course when they see it especially from the courtroom that they've been sitting in for days already uh, just really helps to hammer the point home okay in um in many situations like at trial or or whatever um, have you found that there has been great general good acceptance? Have you found that there's been resistance? People want to challenge something on this or in general, what's, what's your take on that? So that's a great question. I think um, we are starting to see, and, and I, I believe it's mainly because of how the American court systems are. So most of the cases I'm working on now or where I end up getting involved are all from, you know, three, sometimes even four years ago. They're just finally making it to trial. So I believe, you know, that we are going to see more and more challenges because, you know, from a, we'll just use a prosecution and defense perspective, right? I'm, I'm not advocating for one or the other, but as let's say, let's say the, the law enforcement agency has, has, a, has a scanner and, and, or they've used a certain software and they want to get it admitted into court, Right. Well, the defense, the first thing that they're going to try to do, and, and many times, well, they're both guilty of it, but they have a tendency to really you know, exaggerate their point. They'll say, oh, it's never been tested. It's never been peer reviewed. They use a lot of nevers. And so it's in a way, it's kind of a, they're just trying to bully their way in and, and you know, per, it forces the prosecution or the defense, whichever, but it forces them to provide proof, right? Provide that evidence, provide that proof, provide those standards. Um, but I, I'm seeing it much more now. The other one, I, I had worked on one back in 2018. Uh, we It was basically did all of the preparation for a Daubert challenge. And in the end, the defense in that particular case didn't even show up for the hearing. Oh, really? So, um, yeah. But um, so, but I, my expectation is we will see more and more of those. And, and we hear about that also from users around, around the U.S. anyway, that, um, 
that, hey, you know, we've got a challenge to some of the data. We want to get it admitted. What can we do? Okay. So you were uh, you were recently involved in a, a Daubert hearing on the laser scanner. And actually, this has come up before. So I believe you've been involved in more than one now. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, so I've been involved in three so far. Okay. Three of them. And so uh, maybe just if I if I can ask you some questions about your experiences, there's, this is kind of interesting because this, this is really where it, this is the uh, the ultimate uh, test, really, or challenge when it comes to uh, the laser scanner, and and I would say that you know this, although it's a, a ferro scanner, I mean it could be any scanner. This is really about all different laser scanning technologies, different manufacturers, and things like that. I think they all would apply at least at least the terrestrial laser scanners that operate on a similar principle. So. Um, what were, I, I, geez, I got so many questions, but let me just ask you, uh, what were some of the questions that came up or what were some of the things that you were being asked to provide with respect to the scanner? Sure. So in some of these, some of the motions that were filed, um, they would, they would state that, you know, uh, this is new technology. It's, it's never been admitted in, in courts before, which of course, all of that's wrong. They would say it's never been peer reviewed scientifically peer reviewed and uh, and how do, you know verifications things like that so if I were to if I were to lay it out you know the 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 initial um, the initial point that I would make is well it's actually been around for uh, quite a few years in fact I think I used your David cam case you know someone uh, one of the defend defense attorneys that said, well, you know, there's no case law. It's never been admitted at, in U.S. trial, in a U.S. trial. And I said, well, you know, the David Cam case was 2011, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. And I said, so, so, and I, so I basically list a, a, a number of case citations where laser scan data has been used. Second thing I do is I lay out the number of agencies that are using these laser scanners. And I make sure that I, I, I'm sure to point out like our federal agencies, so NCIS, uh, FBI, OSI, any of those types of agencies or groups that are using, and then even some of the major metro uh, customers that I you know, NYPD, you know, all of those. And so I just start listing all of those. The next thing I move into is I say, oh, and by the way, I've got a packet of about 11, even though there are more, but I've got a packet of about 11 uh, peer-reviewed papers that I that I hand over to whomever I'm working for, and they go through and they they introduce them as exhibits, and then and then we reference those. So uh, the one of the most popular one ones that is a paper that you and I wrote on the on the the reliability and accuracy of 3D laser scan or something like that, and uh, because many times there'll be a question, well. How does this compare to a total station, or how does this compare to, you know, other types of, of measurements? And you know, then and I, I try not to get too um, too focused in on you know on, on and I never exaggerate the the accuracy of the device. So uh, I will say something like, well, you know, it's a, it's accurate to plus or minus two. Two, two millimeters at 10 meters or something or 20 meters, something like that. And um, again, I, I try not to overstate it, but then I show these, these papers or we discuss these papers and talk about, because repeatability is another, is another big factor. And in this particular paper, you know, we went through and we, we analyzed, we, we did, uh, we did deviation analyses. And so, you know, so it was a, it's a, it's a, you know, very in-depth piece. And of course, it helps when your name is on there, right? When you could yeah. say, you know, <laughs> and by the way, I co-authored this particular paper and you can go through and look at the information yourself. And granted, this is maybe two models behind now, but the principles are the same. In fact, if anything, they would be tighter. Right. So, um, yeah, it's a, and then the, the last thing, what I try to do beyond, beyond that, excuse me, is then you talk about your experience your experience level, how many times you've been admitted as an expert. Um, you talk about um, the, the, in my, in my case, I had done a lot of training. I trained 70 some agencies and it included in, 
included in those who are, again, some of those federal agencies. So all of that just helps to lend credibility to what you're saying. You've got the data to back it up. And then you show the actual physical, uh, you show the scans from, from an environment that they're familiar with. To me, that's really the recipe for success. Okay. Yeah. And one of the, and one of the part of the Daubert standard, there's like three main criteria, right? So the first one is it has to be useful. Like it has to um, assist the trier of fact. That's the one that the other one is that the testimony has to be based on uh, knowledge that has a scientific basis and it has to be accepted in the scientific community. Sure. Right. And then the final one is that the judge has kind of like the final say type of thing. But I think you really hit on, well, two things there. One is that um, at, you know, the, the scientific basis and the fact that it has to be accepted. So how do you determine it's accepted? Well, one is, I think part of it is the, the papers that you talked about. Um, the other one is the, um, uh, who is using it? Like, are there, are there other agencies that are using it? And actually for a time there, there was a list that was maintained on the, uh, it's, uh, international association of forensic and security metrology website. And I, I don't think that's being kept up anymore because it's just there, it, it, there's too many cases now to keep track of, but mm -hmm. I back in 2000 and, you know, 13, 14 or whatever, it, that was, it was helpful. Um, I, I can't imagine you you have an estimate on how many cases that laser scanning has been even used on now. I I would even I would be hesitant to guess. Um, yeah. You know, and there and so those are the fair. You know, many of those are the fair ones that I know about. I'm you know obviously there are other manufacturers that are that I'm sure have experienced that have similar experiences. That would that would be my expectation anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And then, so, and there's two things here. So there was the, obviously who's using it. So I think, I think that's fairly well demonstrated now. I mean, it's like the horses out of the barn kind of thing or out of the gate. I mean, there's so many people using it now. It's so prolific. If you were to go back 10 years, it might be a little different uh, yes. because there's been so much growth. Um, and then of course, um, what about, what about uh, groups and agencies? I mean, I obviously just mentioned one right now, but have you found that I mean, if, if you're trying to sell the fact that this is being used, do you look uh, like, do you say, well, just the forensic people are using it? Or do you point out that, you know, there's other people in, in other disciplines or, or markets that are using it too? I primarily focus on the forensic and uh, so for crash and crime scene investigation. That's primarily, that's primarily who I, I focus on. Um, you know, obviously there, you can, the kind of spiders out from there, the, the different disciplines, but you know, I, I specifically mention blood stain pattern analysis, bullet trajectory analysis, uh, and just explain how how the technology gets married, right? So you're you're combining a photography, for instance, with the uh, with uh, blood stain pattern analysis, and uh, just you go through and you just explain uh, in the easiest of terms how how it's done, how it's applied, and then again. You know, you have all of these papers that you can say, okay, so when it comes to calculating the area of origin using laser scanners, here's a paper related to that peer-reviewed, scientifically accepted paper. And that's, you know, that's like the, that's the icing on the cake, right? Okay. You, you, what is your standard answer then when you're asked? Because I imagine somebody's going to have to ask you, like, what's the accuracy of this thing, right? And there's, there's a lot of, I mean, it, it can be a complicated answer, but what, how do you usually respond to that? So what I'll typically do, I'll either use, you know, I'll say it's, you know, accurate to plus or minus one, uh, one millimeter at 10 meters. It's just a very, it's a safe answer. You know, one could argue that it could be better or worse. And then, you know, and 10 meters is a, is a relatable distance for, for most, even in America, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so I'll use 10 and 20 meters, something like that. And, uh, and that's, you know, once someone realizes how small a millimeter is, right, then, um, and in fact, this judge, uh, just, again, this judge is my age, she remembers a lot of the same old commercials. And I was talking about millimeters, and he said something to the effect of, oh, yeah, it's a, a, a silly little millimeter or something like that from an old cigarette uh, commercial. But, you know, when, when you realize that, that these are these are uh, they're very accurate devices, right? And I'm not just because I've got a, this this logo on my shirt. 
right? I'm not just saying it's ours, right? There, there are other devices out there that are equally as accurate um, and, and should be able to pass the same standards, right? Um, hopefully they've got the number of validation studies um, that they can fall back on because ultimately, I mean, I remember back in the day when you were telling me that, you know, we needed to get into doing more validation studies, that that was really, that was really going to be pivotal um, in this industry. And you're absolutely, you were absolutely right. And, and we continue to do that even with other features, things in our software. Uh, it's something that I am pushing our internal team that we need to write, we need to write more technical peer reviewed papers on some of these features and so, and we're seeing that. So it's, uh, we just, we need to keep the ball rolling. And I would encourage the other manufacturers to do the same things. I would think that, you know, if you're, if you're a defense lawyer or what, or whatever, whoever you are, and you're going to be challenging, you're, you're probably going to be hard pressed to challenge the technology itself. So you're probably going to go after the, the technician or the, the crime scene person or whatever. And so my question to you would be, um, what would you, and this go, goes in line with this question over here, but what would you say is the minimum criteria for someone, you know, to be able to get on the stand and confident, confidently sort of, you know, talk about the scanner and feel comfortable that they're not going to get, you know, shot out of the water here? So it's kind of a long question, and it, I'm going to give you a kind of a staged answer. Um, I'm not. I wouldn't encourage just anybody to feel. You know, if you've got a dauber challenge, I don't. That's a that's a that's a pretty high. Um, what am I, that's a high. That's a that's a lofty goal. That's a challenging goal, right? If you're interested, if you're introducing your data, the meaning the data or like whatever you've created from it. So for instance, with Faro, we use a scene to go. Um, it's a very easy deliverable to you. So you can introduce that. So you would, you'd want to make sure that your training that you receive a uh, certified training from your manufacturer, uh, if whenever possible, I realize there are times where it can't happen, but uh, strive for that as much as you can. If you were the one that actually performed the laser scans, make sure that you're following your SOPs because I guarantee you that, you know, whoever is analyzing what you did or if they're trying to attack you, they're going to get a hold of or want to know what your SOPs are and find out if you followed those. Make sure you use a reference measurement, right? Preferably something about a meter long. If you have, you know, there are other, other ways of doing a reference measurement, but you're going to find that real world uh, reference, it will really help you. So that's kind of, that's kind of the lowest level. Um, if you wanted to take it to the next level, let's say you're actually the one performing your analysis, right? You're the one doing the, the blood stain pattern analysis or the bullet trajectory analysis. Don't just assume that because you know how to use the software that that qualifies you to present that, right? You still want to be you still want to be certified in blood stain pattern analysis or or shooting incident reconstruction, right? You want to have those in addition to having the capabilities in the software, because otherwise you're going to get roasted, mm -hmm. right? And then the then the final would be that Daubert challenge level, where that's really where you 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 need to do all of your research. You need to have all the papers. What are, if you need if anybody needs any of those papers from me, just email me. And I'll, I have them as a packet, as a zip file. I'll send them to you and you can review those. Um, and even, you know, when it comes to if you have a Daubert challenge and you're really nervous about it, uh, Faro will Faro will expend the resources to come and help you. OK, now I can't do that for the other manufacturers, obviously. But, but when it comes to 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 Faro gear or something, you know, let us know. It may not be me, but it would be someone equally qualified, or probably more qualified than me. But uh, that would come and help you with that, with that Dauber challenge, or at the very least, work with your whichever side you're representing. Work with those attorneys. Explain how you've done it before. Um, this is something that I've done as we begin to get, as we have begun to get involved in those. That packet that I said I sent out, I send out. I sent it to these prosecutors or attorneys 
that may not have a lot of experience in this area, and they can use it as a guideline for things that they need to have and prepare for when they're going to face this challenge. Okay. Sorry, yeah. So it was a really long answer. No, no, it's okay. And and I just want to mention that like Pharaoh has like a you have different training. So there's like a basic training, and then there's like an actual uh, week long forensic training so that you're 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 focused on forensic applications and forensic considerations and you talk about things like standards and scale bars and uh you do exercises like you know blood stain or crash scenes or like whatever so uh, that's i think that's an important point and then in terms of um the uh the number of let's say number of scenes or amount of time it, do you just do you have sort of like a baseline that you would say ah this would kind of be like the minimum you'd want to see uh, that somebody had you're talking about scans for a scene scanning or, or working scenes or something like that yeah i i definitely have a tendency to go the other way i i would prefer to spend a few extra minutes on scene capturing more data um, most of what i see are going to be in the oh on the lower end i would say they're going to be maybe seven or eight scans and then on the higher end you're going to see somewhere around 25 scans unless it's of an entire facility or, or building or something, then you're going to see maybe something in the 40 or 50 scan range. You're not going to see much beyond that um, compared to uh, compared to some of the other disciplines that are using our scanners. But um, we just did a port, uh, a seaport out in California, and it was 945 scans. Okay. So you know, it, kind of run, it runs the gamut. I didn't interrupt you, but the the what I meant to ask was, and it was probably a poorly phrased question, but it was, what would be the minimum requirements you would want to see an operator or a technician have, like how many scans or how much time, uh, like in, in like half half a year, a year, uh, how many scenes should they work before you would say they, yeah. I, now I understand. Sorry, I I did misinterpret the question. I would say. I mean, I would, I'd be most comfortable with a year, right? If they, if they've had that amount of experience, maybe you have worked anywhere from a half dozen to 10 different cases and taken it all the way through and understand it, you know, very well beginning to end, because though you're going to, you're going to be asked a lot of questions about some of the intricacies of some of these, um, how things work. And, you know, that, it isn't like you're expected to know. It's like when you use a camera. You're not expected to know all of the all of the internal circuitry on how the camera works, but there's some basic knowledge what you you need to use you need to have to be able to use it, and it's going to be the same, you know, ex explaining how that laser scanner works, how it how it captures data points and things like that. So uh, that's a it's a very good question. I would say safely a year. Um, it, lower than that, and you're you're going to run a risk. I, you should always err on the side of caution, you know, and then always, 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 you know, run, run it by somebody, you know, in the 3d community, that's got more experience. And, you know, even, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, if you've got a, if you've got a, a competitor, I'm not going to say the name, but if you've got a certain competitor's hardware, you know, uh, Will Henningsen is a great resource for that other manufacturer's hardware. So, Make sure that you that you um, that that you that you talk with those folks as well. Okay, I want to ask you another question about calibration, which can be a difficult topic, and it may not come up in a Daubert hearing, but it could be considered for admissibility. And so, uh, this is difficult because, uh, I, like, I get the question like. So it depends who you are. If you are a lab that, you know, sort of spends all their money on calibrated equipment and everything else, you may do the calibration of the scanner, which is recommended um, yearly, you know, on a regular basis. You do it every year, whatever. But a lot of smaller agencies or different agencies don't do it every year. So I'd like to ask you about how, you know, and it doesn't mean because it's a year and a day, all of a sudden the, the scanner stops working. Um, but how do you handle those types of situations where maybe a police agency isn't doing it yearly, but as needed or when they have the funding? So there are a couple of ways to answer that. First, I mean, the recommended, the recommended period is annually, right? To, to do it once a year. And it's only because it would be a pretty difficult measure, difficult metric to say 
certain number of scans, right? You should send it because you may have an an, an agency that's scanning, you know, 150 scenes a year, and you might have an agency that's going to do two, right? So it isn't necessarily the same standard. Something that I like to do or recommend to do is when you when you first get your scanner, if you could set up um, in a in a facility where you know nothing is going to move, and you can place some of uh, you know hard checkerboard targets like what you have behind you, right? Where they could set that scanner up, they could perform a scan of that room, and then just compare those. Do it once a month and compare those scans, scan to scan. And then you could articulate, look, when we got our scanner and it was new, the measurements between all of these targets were within, you know, a millimeter or two millimeters. It's still within one or two millimeters. The device is working properly for what we needed to do, right? So that, that's, I think that's the easiest answer, easiest answer that I, that I can come up with. Now, something else that's new, uh, so I don't not mean to jump ahead, but so we just released a new scanner. Some of you may have heard that. But one of the cool things it has on it is the is the on-site compensation feature now is like three minutes long. Right. And it does. So when you do um, when you do on-site compensation, it was a kind of a tedious process before. But now it's very easy. You don't have to put up any targets and it's done in roughly three minutes. And what it will do is it actually captures, uh, uh, it does two scans and it does a comparison between those. And we actually advise that you do it with different temperatures so that when that scanner is operating at maybe a low, lower temperature, it's going to use that lower temperature uh, onsite compensation value. So uh, it's, a, it's a really good way. I think it's it's a really good way. But if you're doing that periodically, because it's also going to give you a readout, it's going to tell you if the device is in spec or not, right? So the, those two, actually those three, if you can afford to cut to have it recalibrated annually, please do. Um, or you know the other one is be able to do your own um, your own empirical data, and I think that's that's valuable anyway. Right. If you can go into trial and you can say, look, we've owned the scanner for a year. We do monthly self checks. I'm not saying that's that you have to do that. But if you did do that, that would be that would be a really good thing to have to be able to go and say, look, this is what I did with this device. Right. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting question here. I'm going to bring it up here. I don't know what the name of the person is, but uh, what they're asking is based on the reporting of the latest IFSM and the unusual demands of the instruments and public safety, how do you deal with the scan data that's found to be out when it's sent in for the yearly calibration certification? That's a, uh, yeah, so that's, that's a really difficult question. Uh, difficult from the standpoint of you don't know when it was out, right? Um, what I would do, what I would, the only thing you can hang your hat on is that if you have performed reference measurements on site, if you, especially if you use, if you have something like the scale bar, scale bar has the two spheres on the ends and then the software automatically checks that. Um, you would have to verify that that's, you know, within you know, a certain tolerance. So, you know, my, my expectation is when I perform that measurement, I'm going to be within one or two millimeters of whatever that distance is between them. If it's not, if it's off, I would be very skeptical of using that data. Yeah, that makes sense. And But, but there again, sorry, if I can just finish. But yeah. Now with now being able to do that on-site compensation, and it's so easy, so fast to do, you would know very quickly if there's something wrong with your scanner. Based on the correction that it makes. Correct. Right, right. Okay. Or it would um, tell you. It would tell you if it's out of spec. So since we're talking about the new scanner, let's, I'll come back to the admissibility after, but uh, what other things, uh, I mean, there's, there's been some improvements here in on the scanner. Uh, and what can you tell us about the, the major improvement here, which is the speed? Yeah, so the, my my testing, so I did a lot of beta testing with it. Um, it's one of the advantages of having the most gray hair and knowing people. But um, so I've had it for quite a while. I was doing a lot of head-to-head -head testing with the previous model. Um, at most of my preferred settings, what I found is it was roughly 40 to 45% faster. Um, and also the the stream app, which is basically the, the live pre-registration function works really quite well. It's, uh, 
I, I really like it from the standpoint of being able to pre-register scans and know my scans are pre-registered. Um, the internal camera is better. Um, so, and, and now also there's an internal solid state drive in addition to the SD card. Hmm. So, and you have the option. So let's say our federal customers can't have an internal solid state drive. They can't store data to it because once they use it on a classified site, now that device is, can only be used on classified sites. So they have the option of only writing to the SD card like they do currently. Um, or most customers, what my recommendation would be is you can actually save to both. So you can simultaneous, well, it's not simultaneous. It saves initially to the solid state drive. And then in, in between scans, it's copying that data over to the SD card. So now for whatever reason, let's say you drop the SD card, break it, whatever, hold it next to a magnet and it loses all its data. You still have a backup on the device. So that's my preferred operating mode. Um, so that, I mean, those, those are the big ones, the speed, obviously, um, the, the color data has, uh, I want to say, I'm trying to remember, I think it's a 13 megapixel internal camera for a single image now. Mm. So it, it's quite a bit improved. Um, I can't tell you about future advances, but you know, we're not, there's some more things coming and basically will be a firmware, firmware upgrade. Um, we've priced it. I think I don't get a lot of, I don't get involved a lot in the pricing, but, uh, I think they've priced it attractively. Um, yeah. And, and now the, you know, I've got one here, but now the outside housing of it has a really nice, uh, has a little bit more of a ruggedized edge to it where, um, you know, if you're grabbing it, you're 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 not going to drop it as likely. So it's uh, it definitely has a good, uh, more ruggedized feel to it. The the user interface is faster. So some of our older systems, especially when it got cold, if you were to tap the user interface, it was could be hypothetically a little lethargic. But now it now it's definitely faster, higher resolution. So there's a, even though the case looks the same. Um, everything with the exception of the mirror module have been, it's all new. Okay. It was more powerful. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, I'm pretty happy with it. Okay. I'm going to take one more question from somebody here and then we're going to move back on to uh, admissibility. But, uh, somebody's asking if the new speed of the Faro, uh, scanner is causing a limitation in the scan distance in the range. Um, if the, uh, like it, I guess it drops with speed. So in the scanner, can you still get, you know, if it's a 150, do you still get data up to 150? Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So there is, there is no truncation of the data, um, regardless of, you know, even though it's faster, there's some, I, I, I won't go into why it's faster, but, um, it, yeah, it hasn't affected the speed at all. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. All right, let me ask you about, I'm going to switch back now to, um, there was very recently an NIJ document that was released, and let me bring it up here so that people can see it, but it was uh, something that a number of people uh, worked on, and uh, I have to thank uh, Mike Russ for uh, from San Bernardino for, for actually initiating this because he got a group of people together, and there were people from... Uh, the NIJ, RTI, whatever. And basically we sat for three years and we got together three years ago at the uh, IFSM conference in Nashville. We met once and then COVID hit and then we never met again except online. But we were able to get this document out and you can see it's March here, so it's very recent. But um, I, I'm not sure if people know about this, but I kind of want to throw it out there. But I think it's important in with respect to, um, you know, just giving different agencies something to look at and if they're considering getting into 3D scanning. So someone in the comments here said they were looking at it. Um, this is an important document for you to look at. So David, from your perspective as, you know, working with the manufacturer, do documents like this have an impact uh, with, with you know, some in, in public safety for your group and for your, your department? It does. And um, in fact, we, it's our intention to integrate um, all of the NIJ guidelines into our training. So you mentioned the two different types of training. So the one is basically this is how you use a scanner, right? That's that's the basic training. But then when you have the five-day forensic training, that's where we want to go in and begin to stress because um, this is this is a very definitive document. 
and it applies to everything that we do in our industry, right? And so I, I think it needs to be uh, taught and, you know, and uh, granted they, a lot of them are recommendations, but I think they're very sound recommendations. And now at least we have one paper rather than, you know, what you may have from, you know, in, uh, uh, best practices from individuals or, or different agencies or whatever. Now you've, it's basically been put together into a cohesive, uh, a cohesive document. So yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan of this. And I, again, I agree. Mike Russ has been a, just a tremendous champion uh, with this. And I know you were involved as well. And I think Jason Keller, and maybe some others. So, um, you know, kudos to all of you that put all this hard work into it. And I would heartily recommend anyone who's listening to this to, you know, give it a, give it a read. I think it's definitely well worth it. Yeah, it worked out really well, um, you know, and it, there were different manu people using different scanners there, Will Henningsen, and we had people from, uh, yeah, just all over uh, giving input, I think. So it worked out really well. And I, I, I tell you, I've worked on these things before, these committees before, but that has to be one of the, the smoothest going uh, groups and everybody committed and contributed and it just it just got done. And, and I, I was I didn't think it would actually get done in this amount of time. So I thought that was pretty good for sure. Um, let me see here. I had, I had some other notes about uh, different things about your experiences. Um, what about the difference between uh, the application? So for example, if you're working on a bloodstain pattern analysis, or if you're kind of just doing general crime scene documentation, how does that differ in terms of how you might be judged or how you may be critiqued at trial? Okay, so I'll try to answer this the best I can. Um, when it comes to regular crime scene documentation, the only times you're going to be criticized are when you omit something, right? Um, so try to be as thorough as you can when you're documenting your scenes, right? Don't, uh, I know there's always this tendency, uh, you know, I would just want to get out of here, want to get it done, but be thorough, be thorough in your documentation. So that's one, one level. Because if you miss an entire room, or if you miss, um, I remember I was working with an agency once, and they performed a scan directly over the top of a weapon, right? And they only captured just just the barrel of the weapon, and they didn't capture the rest of it. And you just, you end up, I don't want to say you look foolish, you just don't appear like you know what you're doing, right? So now when you go back to the, to the more intricate analyses, the better you document that, the more thorough you are, the higher the the higher the evaluation of your abilities are. If you've done the bare minimum, they're going to know it, right? Or mm -hmm. someone's going to point it out. Well, this person only did this, 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 and this. Um, so you know, try to be, and this applies to both. But for sure, when you are getting into the more complex um, applications, blood stain, bullet trajectories. Um, on the vehicular side, if you're doing crush analysis, you know, any of those types of types of uh, more focused disciplines, go the extra mile. You never, I should, never is a long time, but I, you will rarely regret doing a little extra work and making it look really great than having to try to explain why you didn't have complete data or why, why this analysis you know, could be perceived as being somewhat faulty. Mm -hmm. And then of course, try to get a peer reviewed with, you know, with an associate. That's, I can't say that enough. Try to make sure that you're, um, it just adds that second level of credibility, right? When you can say, cause I mean, Eugene and I have done it back and forth on cases, right? Where I sent something to him or he sent something to me. And, uh, and I heartily recommend it for, you know, find someone else that you know and trust and, you know, just have them peer review your work um, just goes a long way because otherwise you're kind of on an island. Mm -hmm. Would you say that your, would you say that Pharaoh's scanners are probably the most tested, like the most published on or? So, yeah, when it comes to scientific validations, no, I, I, I don't, I'm not throwing rocks at the other manufacturers, just to be clear. I, I don't believe in doing that, but I know that 
it is my opinion that the ferro scanners are the most scientifically validated and tested scanners so, you know not only the hardware the software um, but there's a there are a lot of validation studies that have performed been performed on on them and which is the way it should be right and obviously i'm biased i do have a logo on my shirt but uh, if i didn't i would still say the same thing you know the number just the just the quantity of of reviews from and from all walks right you have even from the even from white papers you have you have different police agencies or whatever that are doing their white paper studies or you know publishing white papers and so there's there's just there are a lot of documents out there to support it yeah, I think so. And I'm sure that if anyone needed help or some recommendations, they could probably come to you again and, and also ask you for some help. Okay. Um, and, and if I could, one more point though, Eugene. Um, so even when you are going to testify, right, if you have published, even if it's white papers, whatever, if you have published that, or if you have done your own, uh, your own study and submitted it for peer review in any of the scientific journals, that goes a long way in your credibility when you're testing, testifying to it, right? Uh, even though, so with this last trial, um, I have to be careful how much I say, um, there were some reservations about an evidence tech presenting it because the perception was the evidence tech might not have, might not have a lot of experience with it, right? Regardless whether it's true, but that was that perception. If that evidence tech has has taken on the responsibilities of educating themselves, have gotten involved with writing some kind of papers, definitely will elevate their position, you know, in the opinion of the judge and whomever. And if yeah. they have gray hair, that just helps more. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the the research is important because well, for many reasons, right? Like, so one is, of course, it, it assists the forensic community with like acceptance in court. Um, but there's other byproducts. So one is, for example, it may help to establish like best practices or new procedures, right? Um, the other one is, and I always say this, is it's not about what works. It's what about what doesn't work. So it highlights the errors and it helps you create, create that baseline so that you know that this is the line you can't cross, right? So that's important because, you know, if you're doing stuff that it's not intended for or you're going to apply it to, I don't know, something like bullet trajectories and then you know you're making some claims that are just absolutely you know overly aggressive and that doesn't help but but i think just in general it just helps push the limits of the technology or method and so i would recommend like you know even with what you're saying that anyone that's listening or everyone that wants to you know get into 3d scanning you need to think about testing. You think you need to think about uh, working with the scanner for yourself and practicing and trying situations that are aggressive that maybe are right on the edge. Otherwise, you'll never know. You're never going to know where, you, where you're going to have to cross that line. Um, there's a question here, and I'll, I'll just ask you, but because uh, you mentioned before about the auto calibration or auto, like where to self adjust and, and stuff like that. Um, and somebody's asking about how soon do you believe it'll become a standard in the industry? And uh, will it eliminate the need for yearly calibration? So again, I have to be a little careful what I say here. Um, I will tell you from my personal perspective, um, I think, yeah, I, I believe there's always going to be a need for recalibration. If you've got a unit that's handled roughly or something like that, because even though these are, you know, these, these scanners are on construction sites and, uh, you know, all, all manner of different types of environments, but, you know, they can still get dropped. They can still get, you know, handled roughly. So calibration is always going to be there. I believe there's a move or a trend to see that become more of a, uh, to kind of remove that as a requirement. I can't tell you when that's going to be, but I know I, I work a lot with our R and D group. And I, if, if they had their way, I think that would be something that, you know, they would, they would try to do as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I can exactly answer, answer your question, but um, I, I would say at some point that that would become the norm. It might become the norm. Yeah. I don't know. For me, I, I just thinking that calibration is about measuring to some known standard. Right. So that's the other thing for me. I'm like, mm, I don't know. Like, I think if you don't have another instrument or another way of checking it to something 
that's you know at least one order of magnitude more accurate then that'd be i don't know then maybe you don't know uh so you know it's it's a, it's a tricky one and actually this came up as a discussion point during the talks on the guidelines and so it was it was it's one of those things where we're not sure but maybe the technology will get there uh one day that it'll help us but at the moment i i think people are, are saying well it might be better to just stick with the calibration for the moment well yeah i mean having i mean that's why we still encourage the use of reference measurements right i mean i remember back in the day uh I'm, if i mention the name you'll know who it was but this particular person was saying during a deposition they were asked you know how how do you know it's accurate and he said dude it's a laser and um <laughs> you know it's that's really that's not an acceptable answer right i mean and you know comparing it to to comparing it to a known distance is really you know the epitome and one of my favorite methods is you know i like to use um I'll set up checkerboard targets on opposing walls and then I'll use a laser disto and I'll measure and might not even be a brand name that I would, could say on, on, on this particular forum, but I would use a laser disto and I would, you know, I probably for, perform three measurements of that. And I would keep that as my reference measurement only because, you know, I like a long reference measurement if I can do it. And, you know, and you know, that's just a good way, right? It's just a, it's a, it's a, it's a repeatable way and it's something you can hang your hand. And then, you know, now, now you're talking about your percentage of error, which again, is one of my favorite things. Um, but, you know, now the percentage of error decreases, right? When you have those longer distances. So if you're off one millimeter at, let's say, uh, let's exaggerate, let's say 30, 30 meters, right? Now, if you're off one millimeter, that percentage of error is so small. It's just, it's just, it's not an issue at all. Right, right. So don't make your scale bar, you know, one foot across or yeah, 30 try centimeters. To try to avoid that if you can. The, the longer the reference measurements you have, the better it's going to be. And please remember to use them. Um, again, I can't go into why, but please remember to use your reference measurements. Yes, it definitely helps. Um, well, look, we're kind of getting on in time. And yeah, actually, Mike Sorensen is just asking a question here. Uh, that's why you recommend a longer distance. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. So when you have, yeah, that's like like David is saying, if you have a one millimeter error, at, well, especially yeah, Mike's talking about it, sometimes with the cloud compare course or with photogrammetry. But yeah, I mean, if your scale is very small and you have a one millimeter error and you're going to be now be measuring over, you know, 15 feet, 20 feet, 30 meters, that that error extrapolates up like it basically compounds. Whereas if you're at 30 meters and you're measuring something that's half the size, well, then you should have half of the error. So that's why exactly. it's useful. Yeah. So look, David, um, I know we're getting on in time, but if somebody wanted to get a hold of you uh, for whatever reason, is it okay to share your uh, your information Please, here? Yeah. Your okay, let me do that there. So that's up on the understand that I will do my best to respond. I get a lot of emails and I, I'm a little busy sometimes, but yeah. I will do my best to answer. Yeah. And also uh, I, a great point that you made before that if anyone is watching this and their agency is getting into 3D scanning and, or let's say you're faced with a, a Daubert hearing or you have a trial, you have some uncertainty. Um, David here has been very nice about offering some assistance. So uh, yeah, please uh, reach out. You also talked about uh, if you needed some papers and things like that, people could get a hold of you for, for that. And uh, that that's also quite useful. David, as always, pleasure speaking with you. And I really appreciate mm -hmm. your time. Yeah. So th thanks so much for being here. Right. And one of these days we'll get to get, to get together in person again. Yeah, it's been too long, hasn't it? I think it's been yeah. too long for everybody, but hopefully this summer things will things will get better and, and uh, it'll just be a matter of time. Right. All right. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, yeah, hang back for a second and then I'm just going right. to close. All right. All right, folks, that does it for this one. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah, some really good uh, questions and some really good, um, you know, discussion points here. And I, I can see there's a few people there who also have some similar uh, interests and that sort of thing. So look, everybody, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the week and we will see you soon. Take care. Bye bye.